International Luxury Hotel Association. I'm Alex Sonio from Global Asset Solution, uh, an hotel asset management company with over 50 hotels in Europe. I'm also leading the association in Europe and with the board this year, we're going to propose a different webinar. Today, our panel, we discuss the European uh, recovery trend. It's a pleasure to introduce you to Patrick White, the Editor-in-Chief of Hospitality Insight from Questex. Patrick will lead this important uh, webinar and introduce you to this incredible panel. Um, this session is pre-recorded, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to uh, share them in writing and we will respond to them. Uh, thank you for joining, and um, Patrick, the floor is yours. Thanks, Alex, and delighted to be here. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about the uh, European market recovery and then looking at some trends. And I'm delighted to be joined by such a such a great panel. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves um, to you now, um, starting with how they appear in my window at the top. So Mark, can you kick us off? Yeah, uh, Mark Darden. I've been in the business for quite a few years, mostly in Asia and Middle East. I'm currently in charge of all the luxury hotels for our core, which includes brands like uh, Orient Express, Raffles, Fairmont, uh, and Sofitel, you know, so really look forward to this panel and uh, the interchange, you know, so thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Mark, and uh, on to you now, Richard. Yes, hi, good afternoon. My name is Richard Breckelmans. I am with Merit International as Vice President in charge of Southern Europe. In Southern Europe, we have at the moment uh, 48 hotels, 48 managed hotels in operation. Uh, about another 10 or so uh, opening over the next couple of years. Uh, most of the hotels are in the, in the luxury space or in the uh, premium select, uh, the premium space. Thanks very much. And then finally, you, Philippe. Yes, hello. Uh, pleasure to uh, welcome the panel. So my name is Philippe Oudessart, uh, originally a French national, and I've traveled uh, also for quite some time in uh, Asia, in the US, in Europe, uh, and uh, now uh, at the Four Seasons in Athens, um, obviously uh, an important uh, destination as we look at uh, the rebound of, uh, of travel. It's sort of uh, a canary in the, in the mine uh, that sort of gives us a, a hint of what's, uh, what's to come in when, it, when it comes to travel. Delighted to be a part of the panel. Fantastic, and well, welcome to you all. Um, so I'm gonna start things off here by taking a bit of an overview of the situation across the continent. Um, and I'm going to come to you first, Richard, with this one. So what are you, what are you seeing in terms of the geographical split across Southern Europe, um, which markets are performing well and which maybe are a bit further behind? Well, market performance has been fluctuating obviously quite a bit as the situation changes and evolves across those territories. When we look back at 2020, the midst of 2020, after the initial close downs of the first wave, Actually, some of our resorts, mainly in Portugal, Sardinia, the Greek islands, came actually back quite strong. And uh, so after that, the Italian and the Spanish cities, they, they showed some prudent increases during the third quarter. However, unfortunately, after the initial good hopes for this spring season in 2021, the recent returns of the restrictive measures, especially in Portugal, Italy, and Greece, has put this market back. Uh, uh, Spain is doing actually a bit better, particularly the Balearics and the Canary Islands. They are currently performing reasonably well. We actually uh, sold out our three Mallorca-based properties for the Easter period within 48 hours, about two weeks ago or so, when the German government eased the travel restrictions. So that gives hope, right? When, when people are allowed to travel, they're, they're really the booking patterns, uh, they come up really, really quickly. We also have seen actually some, some strong swings in source markets. So besides obviously the rise of the domestic markets, we also see, for example, French travelers now booking strongly into the Canary Islands where they, where they weren't you know, traditionally going to very much. So we continue to monitor the, the, the situation across the region and it evolves basically week by week. And especially we see if the, if the, the changes in, in quarantine requirements really rapidly turn around any booking patterns, so as well up or down. Yeah, it's really interesting. I was looking at the, the, the story in Mallorca um, with bookings there, and it shows that you know, demand is there and there's a lot of um, people want to travel. Um, Philippe, can I come to you next? Um, can you tell us about the current situation in Greece? Um, you're on the ground there. What, do you, um, what are you seeing in terms of, of booking patterns and, and um, well, hotel operations there as well. 
Yeah, as, at a micro level, I would say uh, very similar to the picture that uh, Richard uh, just drew. Uh, obviously, we're, we're seeing uh, a lot of very uh, rapid knee-jerk reaction from the uh, feeder market. Uh, when, whenever there's an announcement, uh, whether it's from uh, uh, Germany or the UK, we see uh, really within the following 48 hours, uh, very rapid uh, flow of reservation, uh, which, is, which is quite impressive and, and really goes to show that there's a there's a very large amount of pent-up demand uh, that uh, people are, are desperate to, uh, to get some sun uh, and to really uh, uh, have a, a fantastic uh, summer uh, coming up. And obviously, tourism in Greece is, is very, very important. Uh, you know, it, it provides 10% of the employment and, uh, and shy of 40 billion uh, euro when, when it comes to, uh, to revenue for the country. The government here wants to uh, put all the, all the chances and... Uh, is uh, sort of delaying the uh, complete opening of the country until latest announcement to the 15th of May. What's interesting, uh, and, and I know some other locations are, are in the same situation, uh, the government will give priority for hospitality uh, employees to be uh, vaccinated uh, probably in the next wave. Uh, so the government is very keen to uh, support uh, the season, the upcoming season. Uh, also announced last week, the government was going to mandate uh, a weekly vaccine for all uh, employees of uh, hospitality and tourism. We're yet to see how that will materialize, uh, but really, uh, we, we're certainly hoping for, for a great summer. And already last year was, uh, you know, as we, we've just mentioned a few minutes ago, some very good uh, surprises uh, in Greece, which had uh, uh, really built a very strong uh, image in terms of a safe destination for, for travel and a sort of uh, maybe COVID free is a bit of an exaggeration, but at least, you know, uh, having uh, space and, and fresh air and, and, and really room to, uh, uh, to, to uh, enjoy, uh, really Greece has been seen as, as a key destination, uh, just like a few other islands that we've just mentioned prior. I guess it's quite hard to show that things can change quite quickly um, when the situation allows that. Um, and hopefully that'll be the case this summer as well. Um, Mark, I want to come to you next. So your role encompasses ACOR's European luxury portfolio. Um, are you seeing any trends there? What jumps out to you? Yeah, I mean, uh, pretty much in line with what uh, Richard said and also Philip, you know, when I look back at uh, last year, actually, we had a, a fairly good summer, you know, we saw obviously destination, leisure destination did better. And uh, unfortunately, we had to do, go back into a, a closed down situation. When you look at geography, I mean, uh, you know, some of the regions do better than others, like, uh, for example, Russia is, has, has really picked up quite nicely. We're doing 50, 60 percent occupancies in those areas. Uh, Turkey is also doing quite well. When you come closer to Central Europe, that's uh, when all the issues are starting. You know, Germany, obviously, with the complete lockdown, Switzerland lockdown, etc. You know, UK, we know. And the slow speed of vaccination. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm sitting here in Dubai, because I couldn't get a vaccine in Switzerland. So I flew to Dubai and got my vaccine the next day. And it was like a grocery store. I could uh, get the Chinese one. I could get Pfizer, whatever you want, at what time you want. So I think we, we really need to learn from these countries on their strategy, very much uh, similar to, to what Greece has done, really. I mean, uh, obviously, they opened over Christmas, New Year uh, very quickly uh, and uh, I paid the price for it. But they really, the vaccination is going very quick. So Europe has to really catch up in that. And we all know that that um, the recovery will come really from the open up of uh, destinations that you can travel, but exactly like uh, what Richard said, and I guess Philip also, the moment the window opens, uh, you know, you immediately pick up, you know, like in, for example, Poland, uh, Raffles, uh, Warsaw, you know, uh, they open occupancies up to 50%. Uh, we were full uh, overnight. Basically, overnight, we could have sold the hotel twice. And unfortunately, after two weeks, they had to close down again. You know, So the moment uh, the opportunity is there uh, to, to really go and visit a hotel, uh, uh, it happens. What is interesting to see is also, I mean, what we try to do is really um, 
you not not uh, you know not look at prices or not uh, go into a, a rate war you know so we kept our, our rates pretty much flat and we actually saw some hotels uh, achieving better average rates because people said look I can't go to the Maldives but I'm going to spend a nice weekend at the Fierjarsan in Hamburg I'm going to take a suite and a nice bottle of champagne go to the fine dining etc so people are really ready to spend. So that's really good news uh, going forward. You know, uh, so 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 there is good news in terms of leisure. When it comes to not so good news, uh, obviously our hotels that are heavily dependent on big fares. You talk Frankfurt, you talk Geneva, you talk Barcelona, and this is going to be very very difficult because nobody knows how these fares are going to come back in into play. And I doubt they will really come into play very, very early. Uh, obviously, destinations with big events that are driven by the big events, like Monte Carlo, with the Formula One, uh, the free Formula Ones, etc., and the big tennis tournaments. The question is, when will uh, spectators be allowed to come back and, uh, you know, watch the, watch the, um, watch the events? So for me, um, you know, I see obviously we were hoping for a quicker recovery. We're all hoping for Easter. It's not going to be Easter. We're looking more at uh, May slash June, unfortunately, uh, reopening. But uh, at a fairly good summer, uh, better than last year, there's no reason we shouldn't have a good year. And obviously, every all the chips are on the third quarter, on fourth quarter, the problem our, all our budgets are really backloaded, obviously, and uh, there's not much to recoup uh, there. So 21 will be a very tough, uh, very tough year still. Yeah, I mean, do you, um, this is maybe for Philippe. Do you think that um, demand will come from countries where there's been a high vaccination um, uptake? I'm thinking the UK, Israel, or do you think it just matters that the whole continent, Europe, and well, the whole um, all the source markets are relevant? that they have enough uh, vaccines there. What do you think of that? I, I think that the demand uh, in itself will probably come from the countries that have had the longest lockdowns and that are really desperate to uh, escape. Now the question will be whether uh, th those uh, segments or, or those sources will be able to, uh, to travel, but you're right. Uh, we're, we're seeing uh, obviously the vaccination status uh, provides them the freedom to travel and uh, announced again also last Thursday, the Greek government uh, gave uh, a free a free pass to uh, Israeli citizens to travel to Greece and to be exempt from the seven days isolation that any other inbound traveler has to follow. So uh, straight from last week Thursday, uh, a, a guest from Israel who who has been vaccinated more than fourteen days prior will be able to uh, arrive uh, and and will be able to roam around the resort. Uh, so, yes, uh, we, we, we understand that there's other deals that are being made uh, with other countries to create some, some bridges. Uh, and, and in some shape or form, I'm, I'm quite certain that there will be one of these uh, from the UK, uh, obviously being such an important market for, for Greece. I mentioned, I just want to pick up on a point that um, Mark mentioned about the split between leisure and um, corporate travel. Uh, are you kind of, what are you seeing in, in, that, uh, in that arena? Is it are you mainly focused on leisure this, this summer? Uh, yeah, sorry, was this one for me? Uh, sorry, yes, but... for you, yes. yes. Okay. So, so, sorry about that. The, no, yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's very clear that uh, that you know, people are very eager to take trips, and as we emerge from the crisis, it's clear that the leisure market will recover first, right? The, uh, especially, obviously, in southern Europe, where you know most of our, our luxury properties are uh, are are, uh, are resorts, but also I think we shouldn't forget about the city center hotels who have a strong leisure component, and that's often the case in southern Europe. Now, from Athens to to Lisbon to Venice to Barcelona. Uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, I, I guess besides that, uh, uh, that uh, people have not been able to travel, also access to culture has been curtailed. So, you know, a lot of European cities are taking advantage of that. They have, you know, incredible opportunities and offers to explore, uh, you know, uh, art, music, theater, dance, architecture, uh, gastronomy. So I think when, you know, bit by bit, these art galleries and museums and concerts halls will open up again, uh, that there will be a real demand. I also truly believe that you know, from 
maybe August, September on, uh, the Americans will start traveling back to, you know, their favorite destinations, such as Venice, uh, Rome, Florence. I think especially Italy will be will be on top of their list. Uh, might not be in June yet, but I'm, I'm positive that it might happen for, for September, August, September onwards. Uh, business travel, obviously, if it is, is a different story. Uh, I do truly believe that, you know, uh, 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 that not, no matter how good the technology is, the video calls or the webinars or the digital meetings will never re replace the face-to-face -face meetings. I think people, they crave connections, they, they collaborate better when they are together. But it is true that, you know, certain types of smaller meetings, uh, you know, might uh, for a while to come uh, still be done uh, uh, with the help of, of, uh, of virtual tools. Uh, however, uh, I believe again that you know uh, 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 virtual or hybrid events will will very quickly come back and people will start traveling with a mix of of online support and people being in the same destinations and and, and on the other hand as well uh, that that uh, uh, there will be other trends evolving such as staycations you know the, the traditionally separated trip purpose you know you go either for leisure or for business, this will blur over time. People will travel and do both. So I think there's opportunities out there as well. Yeah, Richard, I think you're right about the um, the city centre hotels and the cultural aspect. I saw some images of people travelling in Venice last year, and it was people that the city centre was empty. And I think that's going to be an underrated part of the of the uh, kind of return to travel, where people are desperate to get to these historic places again. Um, so I kind of want to turn now to maybe some issues and challenges surrounding uh, reopening. Um, I'm going to come to you first, Philippe, with this one. So as a general manager, what kind of things uh, are you worried about or what challenges do you have to overcome as part of the a big reopening this summer? Right. Um, in, in essence, we, we did not uh, close this hotel, actually. So we're, we're not so much uh, in a reopening phase, but getting prepared for the season. Uh, we, we closed just for a couple of months uh, last year uh, when, when it was mandated by the government. But what, what really keeps me up at night, I mean, first and foremost is, is obviously the, get, the health of our guests and, and employees. Um, and, and we know that at any given time, um, you know, in five minutes, we, we, could, uh, we could receive news of, of an employee or, or a guest uh, who tests positive. So, that, that's the sort of thing that keeps me up at night right now. Um, obviously, we, we have measures in place and uh, Four Seasons obviously has uh, established uh, the trust and confidence for, for our guests. And, and we've uh, rolled out uh, our Lead with Care uh, program, which, uh, which really has, uh, has demonstrated uh, its efficacy throughout uh, last year. And, and we've shown not just in my hotel, but across, across the network that uh, really we were able to um, to uh, keep uh, cases uh, without any propagation uh, really through the measures. So the measures work. Um, but what happens when, 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 when there is a case, uh, obviously that's the other thing that keeps me up at night, uh, especially on the employee side. Uh, and, and when suddenly you could have your, your entire restaurant uh, under quarantine, just because one, one guest or one employee uh, test positive, then suddenly through contact tracing, you could uh, have a whole uh, list of employees that need to return home and stay home for the following 14 days. So when you're operating a hotel at 90% occupancy in the, in, in the middle of the summer, uh, and, and suddenly you realize that you need to send home maybe 20 of your employees, that's, that's the sort of thing that, uh, that causes uh, concern. Um, but really, uh, on a different level, the, the whole volatility, uh, the whole short lead time, uh, and uh, developing the uh, ability to uh, to react very quickly and really to be agile to respond to uh, to the uh, upswings. And sometimes we do three steps forward and one step backwards, and sometimes we do one step forward and three step backwards. Uh, and and really, uh, I'm I'm very grateful for my team here in my property where we've really sort of uh, um, you know, decided to open certain areas of the hotel and then a week later we decide not to and, and vice versa. Um, so a lot of things keep me up at night right now and uh, <laughs> as I prepare for the summer, I, I hope I can get a bit of rest before, uh, before the, the season begins. Uh, but uh, all in all, you know, after all these closures, uh, I've come to realize that uh, 
uh, as a hotelier, it's, it's a lot more fun to uh, run a hotel with guests than an empty hotel. So very much looking forward uh, to, to having uh, uh, the, the hotel uh, with, with lots of guests, uh, having a great time here. It must be really hard to run a, run a hospitality business where you don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. I mean, how do you keep on top of motivating staff and getting them all organized and stuff when you don't know how many people are going to be allowed in over the next few months? You know, you might be really busy, you might be really quiet. How do you go about managing the expectations there? Well, you know, keeping people motivated, you know, I think what's what's been interesting last summer is, is really, um, I mean, the, the mental toll that this whole crisis has had uh, on, on guests and employees, um, but really we've had some fantastic guest comments. We, we've, we've had some guests who have stayed, you know, weeks and weeks and months uh, and, and who really um, uh, gave us formidable feedback. And I think that's the best tool that we can use for, uh, as, as to motivate our employees that we're really providing these memorable experiences that uh, uh, we, we wanted to provide when one day we decided to be hoteliers. So I think having that reward, especially during these difficult circumstances, is, is really what motivates us. And Richard, just coming to you next, I mean, in the hotel industry, we've talked for a long time about the issues of staffing and sometimes the difficulties in getting hold of people. I mean, um, do you think this is going to be harder when things reopen and hotels are busy again? The, I, I would say that Prior to COVID, obviously, you know the 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 demand for uh, for employees for talent was already higher as the supply. You know, so uh, uh, I, I think after the enormous challenging year that our teams have had, there were obviously you know less opportunities to develop people, to grow people, to promote people. Uh, Unfortunately, still many associates are in social schemes even today, right? So we do not expect on the very short term a shortage of manpower. However, it is more essential as ever that we nurture a culture and we don't lose the great talent to other sectors because I think the sector as a whole has been hit very hard and people might you know, consider uh, to move somewhere else or to, to try their career in a diff different sector, which is maybe, you know, less, less volatile and, and, and less certain uh, with different career opportunities. So I think there's a huge job to do there as hoteliers, uh, uh, as governments to, you know, to, to, to train people, to give enough attention to, to education, especially for the local population. Uh, focus on youth, uh, focus on diversity. So I think we have a huge challenge there if we want to have as soon as, you know, the business comes back and it might be, you know, in two, three years, we might be back to the same levels. And then the, the, the issue could be considerable if we don't pay attention to it now. And Mark, just turning to you now, I've seen a few stories in the press about Accor and, and what it's been doing uh, to help with the um, vaccination program um, for coronavirus. Um, but on, on the safety and hygiene front, what have, what have you got planned there? And um, what do you think guests are kind of looking for and expecting? Yeah, I mean, I think um, Accor, like everybody else, uh, all the, the other big companies have introduced, uh, we have introduced our all safe program, right, pretty quickly. And uh, uh, got also, it's certified by companies like uh, Bureau Veritas or SGS and so on. So that gives the confidence to, obviously our guests and our colleagues also to work in a safe environment and stay in a safe environment. You know, so, so I think that's one part of it. Uh, I'm glad to say that all our hotels have been certified and obviously extended now because I mean, this crisis is going on and I think that's a very important part. I think, um, you know, one part is, uh, especially in luxury hotels is to provide uh, choices to our customers. You know, so some customers, might want to have the keyless entry into the room. They don't want to talk to anybody. They just want to go to the room, enjoy the room, etc. Uh, be be on their own and order in room dining and so on. But you have other customers who really want the interaction with our colleagues, and unfortunately, sometimes you know the barrier uh, of the mask. Number one, you don't see the smile, right, of the of the uh, the guest, and you don't see the, the facial expression, which is really important in an interaction between uh, anybody, between two human beings. And plus, then you have that uh, glass window, right, mostly. 
So uh, we really made sure to, to, to move our colleagues in front and, and try to pull uh, actually our colleagues from the back of the house uh, and of the heart of the house into into the front and interact with our customer who wanted to interact with us you know so and interestingly we have seen obviously uh, i said to all my general managers now you have a you used to have a 200 room hotel now you have a 40 room uh, boutique hotel you know so treat it like a boutique hotel engage with your customers and really make them feel com comfortable and understand what kind of level of interaction they want you know so some people again might be a little standoffish and you just have to get that body language and get that feeling you know so i think that's that's one one thing we saw is also to philippe's comments um that our reputation scores actually went really up in most of our hotels some went down unfortunately for many different reasons but overall we have seen an improvement of uh, scores uh, from last year from the year before from 2019 you know so it's interesting to see that you know, less rooms, more focus on our customers. We were really able to uh, build brand loyalty and uh, you know improve our scores. You know, so I think that's that. The other thing I think we did, and I think we were really the only ones to do that, and that's really um, a great vision by our, by our chairman Sebastian Bazin. We launched a fund. Uh, to help all our colleagues in needs because we're a global company, obviously. And unfortunately, a lot of our uh, the, the, the hotels are in countries where there is no social parachute. I mean, you know, when you live in a place like Germany or France, etc., UK, uh, you will get 80% of your salaries and you'll pay your food and you pay, but some countries, unfortunately, can't enjoy that, you know. So, we established that 70 million euro fund and so far we have dispersed half of it, you know, so that this is, uh, you know, I think a, a great gesture and that was really supported by the board. And in these times when we were burning cash really to do that, I think that's something great. It's a great message to to uh, all our colleagues and really to, to the whole world, you know, so very proud of that. I just want to pick up on something you mentioned about the kind of size of the hotels changing, maybe from 200 to a 40 and the layouts changing. Um, I'll throw this one at you, Philippe. I mean, do you think, did you, has your hotel layout changed at all? Are you, are you expecting less guests? Is it different routes for guests to take? Has the layout of the hotel changed? Well, obviously the layout in the restaurants, just like uh, every other hotel, we, we've had to rethink uh, uh, the, the the tables and the and the chairs to make sure uh, we have uh, the, the right uh, physical distancing. But uh, the the resort here, this one in particular in Athens, uh, offers really uh, a very large amount of uh, outdoor spaces, and and the restaurants are all you know outdoor uh, thanks to the the beautiful climate here. So we haven't had to make uh, really drastic changes, uh, and 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 the way the the resort is designed really with different. Uh, buildings, we've been able to sort of open and close certain buildings in order to uh, adapt ourselves uh, to to the demand. But what's what's interesting, um, and maybe not particularly in, in in my hotel, but obviously the trend that we we've seen is that uh, mo more than ever, uh, work and leisure, uh, when it comes to to our to our guests, work and leisure is even more and more intertwined. Uh, and and now now that people do not have to go in the office. And are able to work remotely more than ever. Uh, we're we, we're faced with the uh, uh, the, the interesting uh, mission to identify space in in hotels where people can work, and they're going to get on a call for thirty minutes, and then they're going to go and and visit the Acropolis or or jump in the sea. Uh, and so, really finding a way that we can uh, offer that, and we can provide those those spaces, uh, which again, do not disturb the, the, the guests uh, who are uh, enjoying a, a leisure stay uh, and so that we can do that very seamlessly. So that's an interesting challenge. Obviously, we, we sort of realized that was coming. We, we sort of realized that for a few years that was in the mind of, uh, of uh, our guests, but now even more so as they can dial even more easily than before. Yeah, I've heard lots of stories of people going abroad and going away because, you know, they don't have to be in London or in Paris for their work. They can you know, go to Greece for a few weeks and work and have a holiday at some point. So that's definitely a trend to watch, I think. I've, I've had a guest actually asking if we could uh, find him a location where he his boss wouldn't hear the cicadas in the back. 
<laughs> Good one. Um, I kind of want to touch on something now, which is in the news a lot about vaccine passports, and the EU has got a has got a, a plan to bring those in. Richard, for you, do you think these will become a part of everyday life over the summer and and beyond, or do you think um, it won't be? Well, yeah, obviously, there's a lot of discussions going on about it, and there's a lot to consider now. Uh, uh, ob obviously, uh, I think you know, for me. Most important is that there is a broad consensus within the European Union and, and, and with the UK and, and hopefully, you know, also the US uh, on, on a, a coordinated approach. If everybody's going to do their own thing, it will become a little bit messy. Uh, I, I, I do believe that it could definitely benefit the tourism industry because it will give people, uh, you know, confidence. It will give associates in our hotels confidence. Uh, and, and I guess what people need is confidence to be able to return to uh, to travel as quickly as possible. I, I, I believe that uh, uh, you know the passport could help as well in uh, in in uh, in reducing this quarantine requirement because we've seen last year the quarantine requirements is what influences most, right? Uh, uh, if people had to do it, an, an STR test uh, wasn't of that big of a concern. People just took it for granted as long as they can travel. But having to go in quarantine when you come home uh, is a different story. So I think if that can help, if, if the passport can help, can, can help us in reducing those quarantine requirements, I think it will make a big impact. And Mark, just on the subject of, of um, food and beverage, are you, is this an area that is concern because of just the amount of people and interactions you have there i mean what are you what are you seeing in terms of that arena obviously it's a very important sector a very important part of a hotel business the fmb offering so what are you doing there and what, what do you see as a trend going forward for that yeah i think i think uh, obviously social distancing is is there so so capacities of restaurants are getting halved you know so so that's a that's a problem you know whoever has outdoor spaces uh you know a lot of our gms got very creative and found areas to put tables and chairs outside and created a business out of it you know so that's one the other big business is obviously uh, outside catering, you know, on, on, on catering. Uh, and this is something that is going to stay, I think, uh, in you know, for, for, for homes, for offices and so on. People are getting you more and more used to, to get really great quality meals into, into their offices, into their homes. And, and I say great quality, it's really, uh, you know, catering from Matsuisa, from the Royal Monceau, uh, catering from the Savoy in London. Etc. We've been very, very successful, like many, many other people, and this is a kind of a new business that is developing. You know, so I think we have to be just um, very uh, innovative in what we're doing, and obviously follow the rules. Where it becomes more difficult um, when it comes to bars, clearly. You know, uh, when you look at uh, uh, you know some of the bars, nightclubs, etc. Uh, this obviously impacting that, uh, and. We will have to live with that uh, and 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 uh, you know operate. Uh, the the other big point is obviously uh, meeting facilities. You know what do we do with them? With big ballrooms, we have like uh, you, uh, you know boardrooms, meeting facilities, and so on. So obviously we we uh, working with co working uh, co working companies. We own one of them in France uh, to really utilize these spaces. Uh, and uh, introduce also hybrid meetings and so on. So, so it's really being ahead of the, the curve and really uh, anticipating the needs, the future needs, you know. So, so that's what we are trying to do. Uh, and I think, I guess, everybody is also trying to do. Yeah, I'm going to take that point about the future and move on to our next, um, our next section, the final section, really. It's about um, how the luxury hospitality industry is preparing for the new normal. Um, and Philippe, I'll come to you first in this one. What do you think luxury means now um, for your brand and, and how do you think it has changed in the minds of the consumer? Has it changed or is it, is it the same as it was before? Um, yeah, how, how do you think they feel about it? Well, obviously, uh, Four Seasons has, uh, has built trust and credibility uh, actually for the last 60 years. We're, we're just celebrating the 60th anniversary. Uh, and, and that's sort of very much in the in the DNA uh, of, of the brand. Uh, but as we as we look at uh, you know 
changes and, and preparing for, for what we call the new normal. Um, you know, we spoke about some trends uh, and some of uh, uh, what we're seeing, some behaviors of, uh, of our guests. Uh, and, and we really uh, obviously seeing a focus on health and safety. That's, that's obviously paramount at this moment. Uh, and we're all uh, doing everything we can across every brand really to, uh, to be as safe as possible. Um, but again, we, we talked about Lead with Care as the, as the program that Four Seasons had rolled out, uh, which, which has been very effective. Uh, but as we get to, to the end of this and, and we get prepared for, for the pent up demand that, uh, that is desperate to travel, uh, we, we are going to have uh, what we see for, for the next uh, a couple of years, uh, some, some double budget of traveling. Uh, we, we are going to be dealing with guests who uh, did not travel as much last year and, and who really want to uh, um, cross items on their bucket list. So we're, we're seeing that. Um, and, and we see uh, ourselves at Four Seasons well positioned for this with uh, quite a few iconic destinations, uh, whether it's the Georges V or Saint Jean Cap Ferrat, uh, which, which are those destinations that people are looking uh, on their bucket list. Um, and then extended stay, um, and we talked about it briefly. We've had some guests uh, that decided rather than sort of travel and hop around, uh, you know, in Greece uh, to different islands, but who really wanted to stay put in one place. Uh, we've seen more uh, sort of cross-generational travel uh, whenever that was possible with, uh, with the grandchildren and the grandparents and really getting everyone together under the same roof. So some destinations are, are great for that with, with villa and with, with private retreats. Um, we're seeing uh, obviously uh, trends in, in private dining uh, and organizing really uh, uh, wonderful uh, um, meals uh, in very uh, exclusive and secluded uh, area. So I think it's a great opportunity and, 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 and back to what Mark was, uh, was talking about, it's, it's an opportunity to be very inventive. And uh, Mark, you talked about your GMs who are putting tables and chairs wherever they can. I think this, this really goes to show that there's an opportunity to, uh, to be creative and, and really uh, um, uh, take this, uh, this uh, trend that's, uh, that's going to come up uh, very, very soon, hopefully this summer, but uh, for sure uh, before the end of the year. And how are you preparing for um, uh, the kind of obviously because luxury luxury hospitality has traditionally been a very um, uh, you know high interactions a lot of a lot of interactions with guests because of the nature of the stays. Do you think that's going to change with with COVID? Are you preparing for a different type of uh, role you'll play at the hotel? Well, it's it's a good question. We we've actually seen. Uh, uh, the use of our chat uh, application uh, has gone through the roof, uh, in particular in some hotels, in our hotel in uh, Hampshire, in the UK, also here in Athens. We've seen the traffic of our chat application absolutely going through the roof, which, which has been fantastic. And, and, and the chat is not answered by a, robo, a robot call. You know, it's not a, it's not a computer. We have, we have real people with, uh, with personalities and, uh, and wit. Uh, answering the chat, and, and we've seen great results from, from that tool. Uh, and I think this is here to stay. People uh, uh, still want the human interaction, and we're able to, to give that, provide that through, through such a tool, which is not just a, uh, just a robot, uh, just a computerized uh, system. Um, so I, I think uh, people will want human interaction, and we can provide that, whether it's face-to-face -face or through these tools. And Mark, I just want to to you now because um, you know Accor has been making a lot of headlines over the years with its with its expansion. And how do you feel the luxury fits in with its with its lifestyle focus? And and yeah, how, how does that sit within the company now? Uh, definitely a priority. You know, when you look at um, you know uh, lifestyle, we just uh, split up actually all our lifestyle properties. Uh, the source, the mama, the mama shelter, etc., uh, and uh, we just did an association with Faena also, because it was a clear trend. You know, when you looked at our development pipeline, really, we we saw a huge demand for these properties from a customer's point of view, but also from a developer's point of view. You know, so I think we're in a great space with all uh, our different brands that we can offer from a uh, you know economy entry like Mama Shelter to very high end like Faena. So I think that's definitely going to be uh, something that we continue pushing 
and will uh, definitely developing. Uh, why did we split up the companies? Because one thing we didn't want to lose is the, that very strong DNA of those lifestyle brands. Because you look at so, some of those lifestyle brands, they really started with great visions, you know, visionaries who had a, a strong vision of what they wanted to do and came up with a concept that is very particular. Now, the problem, you mix it up in a big machinery like a car, uh, suddenly it gets diluted. And that's one thing we wanted uh, to avoid, you know, so that's on the lifestyle section. On the on the more traditional luxury, uh, you know, obviously we have... Um, uh, Orient Express that we are developing now, very boutique, very uh, hand-picked, really. Our first hotel will open in Rome. We just uh, did the announcement. We are working on uh, places like Venice and Istanbul, etc. Uh, but that's going to be uh, a few and far because that's kind of uh, a couple of jewels in the crown, really. Uh, Raffles will go will double in size uh, in the next uh, three years. You know, some 15 properties will go up to 30 properties, and again hand-picked. So big, big um, focus on those brands and Fairmont. We have been very, very successful uh, with uh, a lot of Fairmont properties in Europe, particularly. You know, we we are just opening two Fairmont hotels this year. One in uh, outside of Dublin and the other one in Windsor. Uh, so a big emphasis for us because Accor obviously was known as a more economy and premium uh, brand, especially in Europe. And uh, for us, clearly, uh, whilst we want to keep uh, that big that base that uh, is built, uh, that's really the base of the company, we want to uh, strongly expand in the luxury segment. I guess those plans were in place before coronavirus, and it just shows you that the company still values that that um, growth and that they're they're going ahead still, and those those brands are expanding. I guess. Yeah, I mean, I had nothing to do really with the. We didn't really change the strategy, and actually, it was it was um, you know kind of befitting. It's it it was really in response to customer needs and demand, really. Uh, and I said from a customer point of view, but also from a developer's point of view. Uh, developers are asking for lifestyle brands because they uh, obviously are again, you know, responding to a customer uh, uh, demand and are uh, you know commanding a, a higher rate. You know, when you look in the past of the success of W, which was a fantastic success, and you know we're lagging behind a little bit to what uh, obviously Starwood slash Marriott has done. And on to you, Richard. Now, I mean, uh, the role, the the idea of ESG has become so much more important in in the hotel industry, both from a from a consumer point of view, but also from a developer point of view. Um, how does this this kind of concept fit in with Marriott's plans? Well, very strongly, obviously. Uh, first, before I get into that, uh, I just yes, I absolutely agree with Mark. The lifestyle space is absolutely booming at the moment, also. When we look at Marriott, just in Southern Europe, in the next two, three years, we're going to open up four additions uh, for W Hotel. So it keeps, keeps uh, there's a very, very strong demand still in that space. So uh, uh, I, I fully agree there. So over to the ESG. So from uh, obviously the sustainability uh, uh, will become even more essential. It won't be any more preference. I think it's going to be a must. Consumers are being forced to face up to their own consumption. They, they, they're causing many to reconsider their buying behavior. So uh, our guests and customers, they actively ask what we're doing to minimize our environmental footprint. So do our partners, so do our suppliers. Uh, our teams work to manage our hotel energy and water use, to reduce our waste or carbon emissions, to increase the use of renewable energy. Uh, this is particularly important for hotel and rural and, and coastal areas where the impact of one hotel can really have a significant effect on the local environment and the local community. Uh, so we have very high standards and processes in place. So also when it comes to animal welf welfare, uh, responsible seafood, etc. Uh, so travel can obviously be one of the most powerful tools for promoting uh, peace and cultural understanding. Uh, so we, we, uh, we also have a goal of creating you know, a safe and welcoming world for, uh, for all our associates. Uh, I think as a global leader in the travel and tourism industry, we have a very strong commitment to fight against some of the industry's highest risks and most pressing issues, such as human trafficking, uh, exploitation and forced labor. 
So our aim is to ensure that our hotels are places of inclusion and comfort for our guests and our employees. We actually have a, uh, have a program which is called Surf360, uh, which is an environment and a social impact strategy. And it's a very, you know, very strong and powerful platform that guides all our hotels around the world, uh, how to work and assure a sustainable and positive impact wherever we are doing business. And the same for you, uh, for Mark, actually, of course, sustainability, I, I'm guessing it's a similar, similar uh, priority for, for you as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I mean, there's no, uh, and it has to really, you know, you, you've got to walk the talk, you know, so it's not something that you can just put on the wall, you know, it's really deeply deep rooted and, uh, you know, it has to start from the top and uh, we're exactly in line with uh, what the other big groups are doing and, uh, you know, very, very, very committed for sure. And Philippe, I just want to come to you about, uh, we talked about some trends before about um, what consumers might want now. We've seen a lot about, I've seen a lot of wellness and health and fitness brands develop over the years, um, tapping into that mindset. Do you, is this something you're kind of seeing at, at Four Seasons? Very much so. I mean, we, we, we have not waited for COVID to be, uh, to be very much in that space. Um, and, and if you don't mind, I'll just go back for a minute on the, on the sustainability and, and just want to throw that here. Obviously, through COVID, uh, it, it's quite paradoxical that, uh, you know, as we were dealing with COVID, um, you know, we, we, we had to use so much plastic uh, as an industry. I mean, whether it's travel, tourism, hospitality, uh, in, in essence, the, the solution was more plastic to protect ourselves, which, which was really uh, problematic. Um, and, and I just want to echo what, uh, what both Mark and, and Richard just mentioned. Our, our guests are asking for this. Uh, and, and as far as my hotel is concerned, being at a resort and really just uh, on, on the water, uh, it's key that, uh, that we act and, uh, and that we, uh, we demonstrate the willingness to, uh, uh, to overcome COVID and, and to, uh, to get back uh, our, our force behind these efforts. But now again, on, on wellness, uh, very much so. I mean, we, you know, we, we were one of the Four Seasons was one of the first company to uh, open spas really uh, uh, back uh, w when Four Seasons started, and uh, we were very much present in that space. Uh, obviously, during COVID, it was challenging operating spa, uh, but it gave us an opportunity to uh, improve our processes. And, uh, and uh, even after COVID, uh, take, take those learnings and uh, continue to, uh, to provide a, a safe environment, uh, even beyond, beyond COVID, uh, in a fantastic uh, environment. Well, I think that just about wraps things up. We're out of time now. Um, I want to thank all three of you for giving me your time uh, this afternoon. Mark, Philippe and Richard, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Patrick, thank you Alex. Well. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.